www.mpca.org. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Those sounds you hear in the background are those from a protest at the White House by the activists for a free Syria. And uh, who do I have on the line with me now? Nadja, are you there? Is there someone else there? Hi, Mark. Hello. Uh, Welcome. Uh, So this is the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine. And uh, tell us who you are and what you're doing right now. Um, I am one of the protesters as a Syrian American. I'm trying to uh, give my voice and uh, let let it be heard by the American people that uh, Syrians are getting killed, uh, getting slaughtered in Syria by their own government. And for the last two years, nothing was done. Till last night, we were so happy to see the movement finally, even from Israel. We could not believe what we saw last night. And what happened last night? Well, um, the uh, intelligence and the uh, airplanes, the aircraft uh, from Israel, bombed uh, in Kassiun uh, Mountain. I don't know if people know what, what Kassiun Mountain is. They don't. And, Go uh, ahead. Tell it, us. It, it, it really um, has a lot of uh, uh, all the supporters and uh, the, the military. And some. Uh, we heard also there was a lot of Hezbollah and Iranian soldiers in the mountains hidden and they were also had some chemical weapons because when uh, the aircraft bombed last night it uh, affected the, the smell and the, the, the explosions uh, shook the whole city and Damascus is a huge city is not a small city and every one could uh, could hear the explosions were uh, um, very uh, powerful so let, let me let me give people a little bit of background was, here they, they were yep. they were saying there, there was uh, uh, a terrible bad smell, which indicates there was kind of chemical weapons in those mount- in the mountains. So let me, let me give people a little background here. If you're just tuning in, uh, I'm sure you know there's a horrible war going on in Syria. Uh, at least <laughs> seventy thousand have been murdered, uh, men, women, and children, according to the United Nations. That is a low estimate. Uh, that is an estimate actually that's a, at least a year old now. Yeah, m- multiply it by three or four because. This is a number, just a confirmed number. That's just a confirmed number. Uh, most people believe it's in the hundreds of thousands. And, Correct. of course, uh, there's been a large question of whether or not we should get involved. I have had uh, Syrian activists, including people from the Syrian Free Army, right here on the Inside Scoop for more than a year now, arguing the United States needs to do something to stop the massacres, and I myself have endorsed a no-fly zone. But moving up to the present, uh, President Obama declared a red line, a uh, what he called uh, it would be a game changer was his, his word used if Syria were to use chemical weapons against its own people. And now the evidence has come to light from three separate sources, I should say, uh, from the British, the French, and the Israelis have all come forward with evidence of chemical weapons use. And now something, and of course, Jordan has argued that we need to get involved. Jordan is our ally in the Middle East. There's, there's about a million Syrian refugees in Jordan. Turkey, our NATO ally, has said we need to do something to get involved uh, to stop this. And our, our enemies, Russia and Iran and Hezbollah, are, have all been fighting in Syria. Syria, again, against the Syrian people. And I, and I want to emphasize that the people who began this revolution, the people that came on my show a year ago, are peaceful people who just want to have a free Syria. Uh, unfortunately, there has been some infiltration now from Al-Qaeda and others because we've done very little. And the question now is what should be done? The red line's been crossed. And even Israel has gotten involved in, in bombing what really was the command and control center uh, for the government. Uh, and and as, uh, as uh, my caller points out, it has Included what was chemical weapons. So, what what are you protesting for right now? What did, who is the group, and what are you calling for the United States to do? We want the United States to um, destroy more of those chemical weapons to weaken in, uh, the Iranians and the Russians. We know this is a difficult decision to be made. We understand that the reason why United States and uh, Europe, even or Israel, uh, did not step in before it's not an easy thing. Syria is not only the problem, it's the whole region. We understand all this, but what's been happening recently, they crossed the line. This, this uh, 
lunatic, uh, we can call him Bashar al-Assad and his thugs, did, did really cross the line. What they are doing is ethnic cleansing. They are unhuman. They are entering with Hezbollah, with the help of Hezbollah and Iran, entering villages. They are peaceful villages. They have nothing to do with what's going on. They go and slaughter kids, rape women. Uh, it's unbelievable. Burning people alive is just unhuman. We can't believe what's happening. So we need the United States to not only destroy the chemical weapons that they did, we want them to destroy everything that has to do with Assad and his thugs. Seriously, this is cross the line because it's going to not only affect the Syrians, it's affecting the whole region, affecting Lebanon, affecting Jordan, affecting Israel, Turkey, Iraq, everything. You can tell from the news what's going on in Iraq. It's the last, uh, last month was the most killing months and explosions were the, the most in years in, in Iraq. So there's something going on. And if we don't stop this, it's going to explode and it's going to expand for the whole region, unfortunately. So we do have to do something right away. Now tell me this. You are right now at the White House, correct? Yes, yes. And, and I can get closer to the noises so you can hear it. Yeah, let me hear it. So this is, the, what's the name of the group? Syrian Activist, free, for Free Syria? That's an activist? Um, uh, yes. I- uh, w- we we call this this group is the the free Syrians. Uh, what do you call this group? <laughs> Activists for free Syria is what I was told. Uh, Activists for free Syria in the Great Washington area. Correct. Okay, let me let me hear some of the noise. How many people are out there at the protest? I would say today. Uh, yeah, we are like 250. 250. And folks, if you want to join in this, right, you'd welcome anyone coming down to the White House right now and joining in your protest. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. You would welcome others who, who support the cause oh, coming yeah, out no, and joining in. Welcome with us. And we're not only one group. Actually, we're a combination of other people. It's not only one group. But basically, this is this is the group uh, that uh, basically uh, organized it. Okay, and I can hear some of the noises in the background. Let me ask you some of the difficult questions that I know that President Obama is asking and is largely the reasons he's giving for the United States not being involved. Uh, one of the most difficult questions that always keeps getting asked, and it's a fair question, I think you may agree, is how do we make sure that the weapons go to the right people, to to make sure they go to the innocent Syrians that are being slaughtered and don't go to some of the uh, radical extremist al-Qaeda-like terrorists that are also fighting for the Syrian people, but we want the weapons to go to the good people and not the bad people. How, how, how can um, the United States distinguish between them? I have AJ here on the line, and he's going to answer the question for Okay, you. great. Who am I, who's this? Uh, hello, Mark. Hello, AJ. Adrian. Yes. So my question was, how can the United States? Uh, you know, I've been a big supporter of your cause for for uh, over a year I know now. That. Uh, I but know that. but I, you know, there are people in the United States government uh, that are anxious, saying that we're afraid to arm the good Syrian people who are fighting oppression because we're afraid that it will um, some of the the arms will go to some of the radical terrorists. H- how do you respond to those people? Well, there is no doubt by unsecuring the borders all over Syria, there are going to be some radicals who will be penetrating into the country. There is no doubt about that. But I assure you, they are extremely minimal comparing to the defected soldiers who uh, refuse to kill their own people from the regular Syrian army. So I would say this is like 2 or 3% of them, and they consider this themselves a freedom fighter. They came to, for jihad, and they will be leaving the country after that. That's what they claim so far, as far as I know. But overall, the rebels and the uh, defected soldiers from low ranking to high ranking are in charge of everything. But I just want to mention something about the uh, airstrike attack that happened by the uh, Israeli yes, on please do. Some, some targets in Syria yesterday. Yes. Um, it's still not clear what was the intention of it even though it was positive and good because they damaged so much of the artillery that was meant to destroy the Syrian cities. Right. So, Well, Adrian, so- let me ask you how you feel about that. I mean, Syria and Israel uh, have fought uh, at least three wars against each other for the last uh, 60 years. Uh, they're not exactly normally considered the best of friends. Uh, there's the dispute over the Golan Heights. Do you think that this could foretell a new era once Assad is gone and the Syrian people have taken back their country, might this actually help build a peaceful future between Syria and Israel? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. 
I'm sure the rebels are reaching out to Israel to assure them that the border will be secure in the uh, moment of the collapse of the regime. And the bottom line for the Israeli, as far as we know, that they need to protect their border. Which right. Is, I don't blame them with that. So and it sounds are, to me like like this is something where longtime enemies can actually get together against their common foes, the Assad regime and Hezbollah and Iran, and actually uh, lead to a peace that has has uh, you know not existed for more than sixty years. That's absolutely right. It's been a mess, and they've been uh, claiming that Israel is an enemy, and technically they are enemy of the. Syrian people themselves, and they've been building uh, 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 an army to protect them, not to protect the country, not against Israel. They're uh, uh, a bunch of thugs, liars, and the Syrians has always want a normal relationship with the Israeli and and friendly uh, 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 relation and border with them. But uh, that's not going to happen if the Assad regime is still in power because their uh, uh, their interest with the Iranians and Hezbollah it has been going on for a long time. And, you know, everybody knows the Iranian agenda in the area. Adrian, Secretary of State Kerry met recently with General Idris of the, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Is it Idris? Idris? Idris, yeah. Idris, Idris. of the uh, Free Syrian Army. Uh, do you uh, like and respect uh, General Idris? Does he, is he someone that represents fairly uh, the Syrian opposition, or, or d- uh, do you have problems with him as well? Oh, definitely, yeah, they do. I mean, they, they have good coordination uh, the uh, free syrian army as far as i know and uh, you know with with a, a very limited supply of logistics and arms they're still managing to uh, you know control the situation and 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 uh, whatever arms they gain from the regular army the assad uh, thugs and I'm, I'm sure they are in charge but you know still the help that been promised to be delivered has not received, they have not received it well, yet. Well, let's talk about the aid that, uh, it's, at least it's been reported, the United States is giving food and humanitarian aid and medicine, and that on its way is what they call non-lethal aid, things like body armor and night goggles. Uh, it, it, has that aid been delivered yet, or it's still on its way? I'm sure, I'm sure some of it has been delivered, but, uh, um, you know, the Free Syrian Army does not need no food, no logistics. They need real arms. And they have the ability to bring down that regime. But no one has delivered yet. Well, it's, my, it's been reported that Saudi Arabia and Qatar have delivered real arms. Uh, have they, or n- not very much? It's extremely limited. Um, and nothing nothing uh, uh, substantial yet. And, uh, and, and, and how can the United States be sure that the arms won't... I mean, they'll be used against the Assad regime, to be sure, but that after the Assad regime falls, which I have no doubt it will fall, it's just a matter of time, that they won't be taken over by some of the radical extremists that then use these weapons against uh, the Americans worldwide. Well, the Obama administration has to reach out into the rebels and get to know them um, uh, exactly who they are. And if Obama has promised and made so many promises so many threats to the Assad regime for crossing a red line that has been crossed already. And uh, we, we don't see anything uh, uh, serious, serious uh, has been done against the Assad regime. We don't know what the reluctance uh, of taking any kind of action. I believe if he gives the green light to the Saudi and Qatari to arm the rebels heavily, they will be getting rid of that regime faster than we can imagine. Let me, let me give you an idea of the reluctance. I don't share it, but I, I, I have to say I'm in the minority. I think the majority of the American people are probably against us doing anything in Syria. And let me tell you why. Again, I don't share this sentiment, but I understand it. Basically, George Bush took us to a war in Iraq that uh, on false pretenses. Uh, he said there were weapons of mass destruction. There were not. And then we not only we didn't help the Iraqi people so much as invade the entire country with U.S. arms. And uh, in the views, I think, of the majority of Americans, that was a fiasco. That was a terrible mistake. It caused people to be our enemy who were not our enemy before. It didn't do that much good for the people of Iraq, and most importantly, uh, you know, we had troops on the ground who were occupying a foreign nation. I try to explain to Americans how Syria is very different, that we don't have to send troops in, the people of Syria are fighting themselves, that there are chemical weapons here, unlike Iraq, where things weren't proven. How, how can you make your case to people listening to this show right now that helping Syria is very different from what we did in Iraq? Well, it was clear after the Iraq war, after the invasion in 2003, that was raised under uh, false pretenses. But here, that man, that crazy man, that criminal, 
has used the chemical weapons. You talk about Bashar Assad. And I'm sure the international community is aware of the stockpile that Syria has, and it's one of the largest in the Middle East. And what has been done about it? Nothing. Unfortunately, I've heard it from a, a, a former CIA director when the revolt started in Syria that the scenario that happened in Bosnia is going to happen again in Syria. Unfortunately, the, the Syrians are on their own. There's not going to be any international or foreign intervention unless a mass amount of people get killed, which is extremely unfortunate. And as far as we know, and the international community knows, Syria is not extremely rich in oil to impact the world price. If, if, if it did, you know what would have happened. Well, uh, that's like also my Syria. point, is that we, we intervened in Libya, we intervened in Iraq. Exactly. Both countries have a lot of oil. I feel better about U.S. foreign policy when we intervene to save lives. And if we do intervene in Syria, it would be more like our intervention in Kosovo, where it was simply to stop a massacre and not to get low oil prices. Exactly. Bill Clinton has done that. I don't know why Obama isn't taking the initiative to lead that kind of uh, humanitarian uh, yeah, I, I don't know why either. I think, again, he's he's following the lead of the American people who are tired of our war in, in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Uh, I again, I, I personally would never have I did. I was against the war in Iraq. And after Afghanistan, I would have withdrawn maybe after a year. Uh, after we got rid of al-Qaeda there. So uh, it's it's hard for Americans to support yet another Middle Eastern war. Most of them can't place Syria on a map just like they couldn't place Iraq or Afghanistan. And they don't understand why we should help this country versus any other country when we have, when we have problems at home. Can you help persuade someone listening to this show right now why Syria matters and should matter to the ordinary American? Well, we need to prove to the entire world that we can intervene for humanitarian reasons, not for oil. We can prove to the world that we endorse democracy and therefore uh, we've done it under false pretenses in Iraq. We're doing it under legitimate uh, 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 purpose in Syria. It is completely different in Syria. As you mentioned, the Syrians are starving for democracy and they've been, getting, they've been murdered and slaughtered by a thug and a murderous regime. And under the uh, international community's uh, eyes, they're watching, and, you know, with cold blood, he's been slaughtering villages day after day. And we don't see any kind of intervention except condemnation, which is not doing anything to the Syrians. Adrian, give me some examples, just from your own experience, people you know, family, friends, uh, some of the horrors that you, specific, because sometimes you say 70,000, 100,000 people, 200,000 people, that's a number, and people have a hard time relating to a number. So tell us some stories of things that you know to have occurred in Syria with friends or family or colleagues of yours. Mark, I assure you those numbers um, are way more than uh, the UN uh, uh, numbers. Yeah, uh, I think so too. I'm, I'm, I'm positive uh, the unaccounted for, the missing, and the jail are like three, four times that number. So we're talking about three, four hundred thousand people are either dead or in limbo. Give it to us in personal terms, uh, because sometimes people can relate to the story of a child or the story of, of, of a family member more than they can to a number. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just the way, the way it is sometimes. Give us some, some real-life examples of some things that you've seen or you know to have occurred in Syria. Well, I've been active on the Internet and through Facebook. I've been communicating with so many activists inside Syria. Um, I've seen live videos and, uh, you know, the, the, the Assad regime, they've been videotaping those crimes and selling it because they are money hungry and they would do anything for money. They'll tell you that they're acting, uh, they have a mercenary act. So some of those videos, uh, girls at the age of two or three running inside their house with their mom, and the video shows that they've been killed, they've been killed in their own bedrooms. Mm. And those thugs, they videotape them while they're laughing. And with cold blood, they're still in those videos. I've seen it in my both eyes, and I do have it. So this is just a small example from what's happening on the bigger picture. Uh, but, you know, I don't know if you've heard of the massacre that happened two, three days ago. Tell us about it. 800 got slaughtered. And they've been telling people with the speakers, you need to leave your home right now within a half an hour or we're going to... Uh, slaughter in your own home. And they've been asking them to bring the deed of their homes with them. And they're, they're, they're confiscating their IDs along with them. It's as if they, were, they want to do it, you know, illegally. They want to confiscate their property and kick them out. So they're kind of genocide on the um, um, uh, coastline. They want to clear the area. 
and so much speculation about uh, um, announcing their own state, the Alawite state, on the uh, on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's interesting that you mentioned an Alawite state. Uh, the Alawi, of, of course, for those who don't know, is a, a, a actually a, a group of Shia Muslims. They're not all Shia Muslims. It's a, it's a sub-part of, the, of, of Shia Muslims. They're the ones that actually yeah. they control the country. Uh, Bashir Assad is from this Alawi sect, and uh, there may be 14% of the country, about one in seven. And basically, the fear among the Obama administration, and, and, and frankly, England and France and others, is that, ir- that Syria is becoming a sectarian civil war, a war between Shia and Sunni, between Alawi and the majority Sunni, and of course there are also Druze and Christians and so forth. Um, do you fear that, it, that Syria is becoming a religious civil war? Absolutely not, because that's exactly how they want it to look like. They've been, uh, uh, they've been trying to drag uh, so many sects from uh, Lebanon, uh, into that kind of uh, dirty war. But Syria has always been uh, um, a role model in, in, uh, in uh, you know, uh, diversity of uh, religious background. And we've never had any kind of conflict, religious conflict in between us. But that's how exactly they want it to be happening, because they got the Iranian involvement heavily. And we all know what is the Shia in Iran's uh, uh, agenda in the region. Uh, they keep on dreaming of their empire, uh, Persian empire, and they don't want to lose the Syrian influence in the area because that will affect uh, uh, Hezbollah in the uh, southern part of Lebanon, and they don't want to lose this kind of influence in the region. So for those that don't understand, uh, Iran is a, a Shia state, a Shia Muslim state, and they have been supporting the Assad regime for uh, well, decades, and they also have a group that's been uh, um, it's it's a terrorist group, and it's been it's actually formally denominated a terrorist group by the State Department called Hezbollah, which controls uh, really most all of southern Lebanon. They're the ones who who rain missiles down into Israel, and they also persecute the Sunnis and Christians who live in Lebanon. So there's this unholy alliance, as it were, between Iran, the Assad regime, and Hezbollah, and it's been reported, Adrian, that Hezbollah is actually on the ground fighting in Syria. They've left Lebanon and they're fighting in Syria. Uh, do you know that to be true? Absolutely. Hassan Nasrallah, he made it clear that he has... A complete Nasrallah is the head of Hezbollah, just for those who, who don't know. Hassan Nasrallah no. is, yeah, is, is the leader of uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah, so right. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. And, and Iran just recently announced publicly that they have an interest um, in, in fighting or aborting the Syrian revolution because they don't want to lose that strategic interest with the Assad regime. Of course, Hezbollah is, uh, is, is the main uh, reason. They don't want to lose. Because the Syrian regime, the Assad regime, has always been the transporter uh, for Hezbollah regarding arms, ammunition, and protecting them from any other six in Lebanon as well. Yes, yeah, so those are some of the munitions, actually, that Israel is now uh, attacking to make sure that they don't go to, to Hezbollah. So let me ask you this, Adrian. We only have about uh, five minutes left. What is it specifically that you would ask the Obama administration and the American people to do? What do you want? You want a no-fly zone? You want weapons? I don't think you want American uh, troops on the ground, do you? Specifically, what do you want from the United States? Absolutely not. Obama has to show the world, the leadership, and he has to maintain his credibility, not put it in jeopardy, because he has made it clear. Using a chemical weapon is a red line. I mean, we don't want the world to say that he's colorblind. Of course, he knows exactly what's going on. A red line is a red line, and it has been crossed. So, so what would you have us do? Uh, what, what would you ask uh, President Obama to do, specifically? We need, we, we need to arm the rebels. We need to arm them, and we need to make sure who are the rebels. So we need heavy involvement. We don't need no boots on, on the ground in Syria. Uh, just uh, enough logistics in the northern part of Syria, bordering Turkey. They can, uh, they can help those rebels with all kinds of logistics and minimal uh, uh, armament. That'll do it. And they have, they have a strong belief that they can topple that murderous regime. What, 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 go ahead. I have a guy who would like to talk to you, a young kid sure. from Syria. Please, please do. Yes. Hi, how's it going? Hi, what's your name? My name is Mohammed. I'm a freshman at George Mason. Mohammed, welcome. Welcome to the to the Inside Scoop. But uh, tell me, what what uh, are you recently from Syria? Have you been here a while? No, I was born and raised here, but I go to Syria every every summer to visit my family. And what have you seen happening what, there? Well, what I've been seeing happening there is 
essentially the Arab Spring. I mean, I don't want to like you obviously know all the terrorists right. so spread to it, and then and you have so you have pro, basically just protests for simple reforms. They, and these protests were met with you know artillery, live ammunition. I mean, in the first couple months alone, a couple thousand people were killed for no reason, and that's when it keeps. And then eventually, you have defected soldiers who refuse to kill their own people. You know, I mean, if Obama right now like, orders the National Guard to bombard Baltimore, right? yeah, but exactly, they won't do it. Yeah, they won't do it. They just they they, they defect and they, instead they protect Baltimore from other soldiers who want to kill. That's what the FSA is essentially. Right, That's and Assad is. is actually using Syrian aircraft to bombard Syrian villages. It's, yeah. it, it's an amazingly disgusting thing that's happening. Do you support a United States no-fly zone to keep Syrian aircraft from bombing Syrian villages? Oh, 100%. I mean, this, is, this, this man is no longer a leader. He's, he's, as far as we're concerned, he's an occupying force. He's lost all legitimacy, and he has no support among the people. So the fact that he even has these aircraft, anti-aircraft carriers, is unconstitutional by, you know, by, by human existence and human nature. Mohammed, let me ask you this, uh, because I've been calling, of course, for U.S. intervention for more than a year now. Uh, but there are people who, who disagree with me. And now those same people are saying, you know, it's too late. Uh, maybe it should have been done a year ago, but it's too late now. Al-Qaeda has infiltrated the rebel groups. Uh, the, the good Syrian people, four and a half million are, are refugees. A million outside the country, three and a half million internally displaced. The, the good people have all left, and now it's Al-Qaeda and Assad. And whatever we could have done, it's too late. My question for you, Mohammed, is it too late? There are, there are, no, it's not. There are 20 million Syrians. Four million leave. That means you have 16 million left, good and, good and well, ready. And, and these are, it's not like, this isn't like Iraq, where you have America invading. You have the Syrian people literally begging for any sort of assistance. And it's, the thing is, it's, all we've been giving them is food. I mean, what are we going to do, throw, throw spaghetti at the soldiers? <laughs> oh, what are we going to do with that? We need, it's true, it, the, every day we wait makes it harder and harder and that much more disgusting and more of a volatile situa situation. But it's, it, it's better now than in a year. And it's better, it, it would have been better a year ago too. So every day we wait, we lose more time, more people, and more credibility and trust for, the, for future alliance. I mean, the Syrian people are going to know, they're going to remember, that America didn't help us, help them. They helped Libya, they didn't help us. They're going to remember that. You make a powerful argument. Mohammed. I want to thank you uh, for coming here. I, I, I get goosebumps when I think about what's going on in Syria. And I want to encourage people, if there's still time, to join the protest at the White House right now. Encourage right now. Just drive out to the White House. Uh, take, go, take the Metro to McPherson Square and, and join the attack. And I just want to emphasize, uh, no one, certainly not I, certainly not the, the activists for Free Syria, no one's calling for an American invasion or occupation. This is not Iraq. This is not Afghanistan. I oppose the war war in Iraq. I oppose the, the continuation of the war in Afghanistan for 10 years. This isn't like a backward country like Afghanistan where the people can hardly read. Syria, uh, Adrian was right, was a role model for coexistence for Christians and, and Sunni and Shia Muslims and Druze all living together in a very secular country. It wasn't even a, a very religious country. And it's, it's falling apart. And uh, really, this is the kind of thing where um, Turkey and Israel and Jordan and all of our allies uh, want us to get involved, Britain and France. And I would like Obama to, to follow through with what he said. And uh, the red lines were crossed. Thank you very much, Mohammed and Adrian, everyone, for, for calling in. Uh, we, this is not the last that I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to keep talking about it until finally there's some relief for the Syrian people. Thank you very much for coming here on the Inside Scoop. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. All right, coming up next is a very different uh, kind of discussion, but uh, one that maybe uh, comes closer to home, but it's certainly very important. And, and that is whether or not we're spending too much time on the Internet. Uh, the irony is that the Internet brings us some really powerful things like uh, these people in Syria giving us frontline accounts of the war going on there because they're not allowing ordinary reporters in, uh, and uh, they're giving us tweets and, and YouTube things uh, from there. At the same time, we've got crazy conspiracy theories. We just talked about that in the Raucous Caucus that are also on the internet, and some of us can't seem to get off our Facebook accounts. We sort of stick there all day long and can't get out and enjoy the sunshine. So coming up next is author Henry Senkowitz, who has a new book out called Untangled, to talk about maybe how we should distance ourselves a little bit from the internet and social media. I uh, just want you to stay tuned for that. And also call in if you want to discuss uh, with Henry or with me, 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is We Act Radio. And we'll be right back right after this. Radio.com.
Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Uh, if you haven't heard the news, it's really strange stuff going on in Syria right now. I mean, you probably know that uh, 70,000 at least have been massacred. That, by the way, that's the minimum number from the United Nations. It dates back to 2011. It's probably well over 100,000, if not over 200,000 innocent people massacred by a vicious dictator, Bashar Assad, who's not just a vicious dictator, but is one supported by our enemies. What's interesting in the past, we've had vicious dictators uh, like Mubarak, uh, or the Shah of Iran or others that we've supported. This is a guy supported by Russia, Iran, the terrorist group Hezbollah. It would seem to be a clear target. I mean, this is a, a guy killing innocent people that uh, helping no U.S. interests. I don't care whether you care for moral reasons or you, kill, you care for American policy reasons. I think we need to do something to help the Syrian people. I recognize that the American people are, are tired of war uh, after Iraq and Afghanistan. I been calling for our troops to come home from there for years now this is a cause i think is is uh well it's worthy Rem remember rwanda we did nothing in darfur we did nothing in cambodia we did nothing this is our chance to be on the right side of history i i did promise you author henry sinkowitz on untangled we will get to him i promise in about 15 minutes but i do want to get one last guest on uh, who actually uh, saw, uh, I believe, um, uh, he, he's going by the name Ronnie. He's, we're not going to use his real name because I don't want him to get in trouble with the regime. But Ronnie, your family is still in Syria right now, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Tell me what happened to your family in Syria. Uh, my father-in-law, who's um, 88 years old, um, two years ago was in front of um, my sister-in-law's house, and he was kidnapped from there. And um, we kept asking everybody, what is he? He just disappeared. 88-year-old uh, man disappeared. Yeah, he's because he opposed the regime, and uh, they felt he may, because we are uh, from the minority in Syria, and they felt he may be a threat because they want to try to portray the, the war there as between... Uh, you know, Sunni and, and other people. Now, this but is interesting. So you're from the Alawi uh, minority. Um, no, we're from uh, the Druze minority. The Druze minority. Okay, but, uh, but the Druze are not Sunni. And what you're showing is that uh, it's not just a Sunni Muslim cause. It's a cause for, for all the Syrian people. Yes, yes it but, is. But here's yes. what I find interesting. Your 88-year-old father-in-law surely was not able enough to pick up arms and to attack the Syrian regime. Clearly, he posed no physical threat to the regime. To be honest with you, they, they don't care. These people, will, they, they have killed children who are 12 and 14-year-old kids just to punish their parents. These people have, uh, you know, uh, they, they don't have any mercy. They, they, you know, they feel that this is the way you, you teach people a lesson by, by massacring the whole family. You know, it, it just the last two, three days in a town on the west coast of Syria, you know, the whole villages have been, uh, you know, massacred. We don't have exact numbers because nobody could verify... You know, what's left, what's not. Everybody who's, who's alive running away from their town. And, uh, and the problem is, uh, you know, um, we don't see an end. You know, uh, right. the team is, like you said, supported by Hezbollah and by uh, Iran. And they're giving them a lot of manpower, a lot of money and weapons. And, uh, and of you course, know, you point out you're not on CNN. The reason you're not on CNN, that's not really CNN's fault. I mean, they could risk their lives to go in there, but the Assad regime does not allow any reporters in there. So yeah. when there's the war in Libya, people could see pictures. Uh, it's in, in Syria, you have to smuggle them out on the internet. And yes, they kill them. I've, there's few reporters who were killed by That's the Syrian right. regime. If they know that you're a reporter, they, they target you. That's exactly right. Uh, reporters, Western reporters, as well as uh, uh, Syrian reporters, have been killed by yeah. the regime. Well, Ronnie, I wish you uh, uh, good... good uh, Good wishes. I uh, certainly strongly support the United States doing something to help the Syrian people. I, I personally, I support a no-fly zone because the idea of, I, I just imagine. Uh, and even I think, hands, to be honest, to, to just even the hands a little bit. So because we really, we don't want to you know, procrastinate this war because the longer it goes, the more it's going to become a bigger problem. I, I think you're right. Mohammed brought up an interesting point. He said, what would happen if, if uh, the National Guard or the Air Force were to bomb Baltimore? If, if our own America... It, it, it's unthinkable. You just say yeah, these words. It's unthinkable that American military would attack American cities. You can, might imagine some renegade soldier, some crazy mentally ill, one or two people doing something like that. But the idea that a, a, a leader would order the military to massacre... The people, it's, it's, it's unthinkable in America. Yeah. And, and my guess is that, I mean, even though there was a horrible dictatorship in Syria for, for decades, that in Syria, people never thought this would ever get this far. 
Exactly. We we never thought our own army would attack us. We you know. So, uh, listen, I, I support your cause. I will continue to Thank be out there supporting your cause. Uh, anybody who's listening to you could support us by calling their congressmen, and, you know, they'll be really great. So. Yeah, this is called We Act Radio, so go ahead and act. The Capitol switchboard, by the way, uh, and it's there's, it's Sunday, so you'll probably just have to leave a message, but you can definitely call okay. next week. 202-225-3121 will get you to any member of Congress. Urge them. Again, no one's asking for an invasion of Syria. The Syrians don't want it. I don't want it. Americans don't want it. But simply a no-fly zone to stop the Syrian aircraft from massacring its own people. Let's remember Rwanda. Let's remember Darfur. Let's remember Cambodia. Cambodia, I believe we have a, a obligation as the most powerful nation on earth to stop mass murder when we can. And, and not just because it's the right thing to do, that's the main reason, but also because people will remember. And they'll remember whose side we were on. Were we on the right side of history or did we stand by while others were massacred? Thank you, Ronnie, for coming here on the Inside Scoop. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark, very much. And thank you to all your listeners. If you want to join in the protest, it's occurring right now at the White House. Uh, all you have to do is go down and join the protest right now at the White House uh, and, and help the people. It's interesting about this issue, and uh, w- w- we could take some calls about it uh, later on at 202-889-9797, is it's not your typical liberal conservative issue. It's really an isolationist versus internationalist issue. And there are liberals, no question, people on the left. I've, I've had some of you call into my show who actively believe we should not get involved in Syria. Uh, I, I would argue you're an isolationist. Uh, and then the conservatives are split, too. There are conservatives that want to intervene and conservatives that don't. So there are people on both sides of this. Uh, and it's something that, uh, that will always be up for debate. Um, let's see who we've got on the line here. Oh, uh, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Who's this? Hello, Mark. Yes, you're on the air. Okay, great. I have um, a very important woman in uh, part of the Syrian revolution. Her name is very well known. Her name is uh, Farah al Okay. And she is going to uh, 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 talk about what's going on. She's originally from Homs. Oh, and, Homs, uh, of course, is one of the cities that was has been almost destroyed. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, She's talking right now in Arabic uh, to the group. Okay, are you going to translate for us? From the Nazi is Bashar al-Assad. She's talking in English anyway. We have a message to hear about Barack Obama. We would like all our fellow American citizens to hear this message loud and clear. Today, there is a Holocaust in Syria. Listening to a live protest uh, that's occurring right now at the White House uh, from the Syrians, uh, f- uh, f- the activists for a free Syria. Uh, obviously, the passions are high, and the question is whether President Obama will keep his word 
Uh, he said that if the Syrian regime used chemical weapons, that uh, that would be a red line, that would be a game changer, that would cause the United States to come in and help the Syrian people. The evidence is now overwhelming. Even the United States uh, has admitted that they've used them. Now they're saying they use them in small quantities. The red line appears to be changing, and the question is whether President Obama will help the Syrian people. Yes. Yes. So um, you heard uh, Miss Atashi is, is very, very uh, uh, well spoken, and she's been all over the world uh, representing the Syrian woman and the Syrian people in the United States. And we played her right here on the Inside Scoop, and I want to thank you for calling back and for doing that. Uh, oh, th- sure, th- this sure, will not be sure. the the end. Uh, I guarantee you. I will promise. I will keep on this topic uh, until and unless there's this peace in Syria. So thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for all your support for all the people who are supporting us, including the Israeli people. Thank you so much, and may God bless. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, and thank you very much for, for calling you. in. Thank you. Take care. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. All right. Well, you know, it's 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 a very it's an emotional issue, and uh, I don't blame them. Their country is being ripped apart. Uh, this was a peaceful country, and it was one where, yeah, there was a dictator in charge, and the people simply wanted, as part of the Arab Spring, to have equal rights, to not live under a police state where everything they say is being watched and monitored, where there's a secret police. Uh, and Syria is a very modern country. This isn't like uh, Afghanistan, where most people are illiterate. Uh, these are literate people. Damascus is, I think, the oldest capital city on earth. It's been around for 5,000 years. And sadly, a lot of the wonderful treasures, archaeological treasures, crusader castles and ancient palaces are being destroyed in this war. But most importantly, of course, is the human cost. Hundreds of thousands of innocent men, women, and children dead. Uh, millions are being exiled and a once prospering populous country is being um, well decimated. There is some good stuff, though, that I think can come out of this. Uh, the irony is that uh, they say, uh, uh, I, I, um, uh, I'm messing up the, the slogan, but hard times make for interesting bedfellers. I'm, I'm sure I'm ruining the, the cliche. But the point is that sometimes enemies can become friends in, in the worst of times. And in this case, ironically, Syria and Israel, countries that have been at war for 60 years, are joining together against the Assad regime. Again, also with Turkey and Jordan. These are moderate Arab Muslim countries joining with Israel, all in the fight to help the Syrian people. To me, if this is not a cause we can support, I'm not sure (laughs) what one is. This isn't about oil. It's simply about human rights and justice. So I want to thank all my callers for calling in. I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back, I I do have a change of pace. Uh, Henry Sekowitz is the author of Untangled. And, you know, many of us uh, sit around and we uh, spend all our days on Facebook and tweeting and uh, looking up the Internet. And sometimes I I think um, I was just on the Internet yesterday and uh, someone said to me, oh, it's a beautiful day outside. And I'd hardly noticed. So uh, maybe I need uh, to see a psychiatrist or maybe I just need to read Henry's book, Untangled, and find out how I can actually leave the Internet and go out and enjoy the sun. It's harder sometimes than you think. Uh, We'll be right back with him and also with your calls if you want to talk about the Internet and social media and whether or not you ever want to get untangled, give us a call at 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. So uh, we're going to get away from uh, the horrors of Syria and talk about something that's, uh, uh, well, awful in its own way, but definitely not, uh, definitely not on the scale of what's going on in Syria. But uh, you know, when we talk about things that go on in America, uh, some some of it is that we're wrapped too much into. Uh, the things are going on the internet, and author Henry Sinkowitz has a new book out called Untangled, uh, and he's going to tell us how to get away from some of these things. So, Henry, welcome to the Inside Scoop. Hey, Mark. Thanks for letting me have a chance to ta- talk with you and your listeners. 
Um, it's really a pleasure to hear you. And although I have to say, I'm, I've been absolutely overwhelmed with emotion from the last few segments. I yeah, it's, it's it's a powerful thing. And I, you know, I, I try to deal with all kinds of topics. Uh, it's 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 kind of a sharp difference from 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 Syria on to uh, uh, to, to social media. But uh, social media is something that Americans, uh, most of us, are faced with every day. I guess I, I don't know about you, but I have a, about a hundred emails in my box, and most of them appear to be from Facebook. I'm not sure or, yeah. or tweeting. Yeah. I I wish, uh, in my daily life, I'm, I live very much in the technology space, and I wish 100 emails would, is, is sort of at the low volume of that. <laughs> oh. And then I've got a whole Twitter f- set of followers just because of all the technology stuff I've done over the years. And so, I mean, I've got like over 40,000 Twitter followers just who are sort of watching me, which just kind of overwhelms me on so many levels. That's amazing. Well, yeah, I hope you tweeted out today's radio show uh, so people have, can listen in. Oh, yeah, it's, it's all so, out so there. So tell, tell us, uh, for those of my, my audience that don't know who you are, who you are when you say you're in the technology space, what does yeah, that even um, mean? Well, actually, I, I do a whole bunch of things. I, I'm very much inside, this, the, inside cyberspace and the cybersecurity world, and then as well as being considered one of the fathers of cloud computing. I mean, most notably, this year I was named Computer World Premier 100, so the 100 top technologists in their mind for this year. It's, I feel a little old when they did that. Um, it, it's a lifetime achievement. That's award. very impressive. So when my, yeah. when my computer goes down, I just go to you, basically. You, 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 can, you, could, you <laughs> could do that. I mean, I, I, I could probably help you out a whole bunch. But that, that's like going to the president when you've got a, 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 um, oh. so you got a, a pothole in, in, your, in your sidewalk, hey, and you call, hey, President hey, Obama, fix my pothole. Well, uh, Henry Mark, will fix Mark, my computer. Mark, um, I don't know if you've ever, my, my mother, I mean, she will do that to me on a regular basis. <laughs> there you go. Although she, she brought up something that you just brought up um, right before you went um, on into the next segment. And that was um, yesterday you were talking to friends, and they were saying, what a beautiful day. Right. And we were down in Florida for the, holi- uh, for the holidays in December. And there we all were, just kind of living in our little uh, electronic media world. And my mother, who, who, who's in her early 80s, um, made the comment, and who, she said, I just want you all to talk to me. You're all here. You're all down in Florida. The weather is beautiful. You just need to talk to me. Um, and it was very precedent. I mean, it's, it's very much what I was writing about in the book. And I mean, and, and Untangled is dealing with this whole notion of this overwhelming volume, velocity, and variety of entanglements in your life. I mean, is it social media driven? Yeah. Is it Twitter driven? Yeah. Is it just all these other things that are just dumb? Um, it's also your us? mother calling you all the time saying, why haven't you called me like you should? Why aren't you a good son? I actually, I, I don't That's have an that. entanglement I, too? You it, 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 that <laughs> is an entanglement. Relationships are an entanglement. <laughs> your career is an entanglement. Sure. All of this stuff or your entanglements and it's how you're dealing with all this stuff that is just grabbing on to you and as I characterize in the book all these little things these little vines that are catching you on this journey as you're, you're traveling down the path that you're living so. so so now this is uh, your second book, your third book. Uh, this, I, I lose count how many books you've done. <laughs> this is my second book. Um, uh, okay. First book came out in 2006 and it was called Centerland and it dealt with trying to find organizational interpersonal balance um, and looking at that from a dynamics perspective. Um, and then that sounds like a lot of good jargon and gobbledygook uh, to me. Do you know what? As a radio host, I mean, some, some kind of double think perspective. Oh. I, well, come on, help it, me out here. Well, it, it, it was s- sitting down and trying to figure out how do you find balance in your life. And this is actually very much a follow on to that, but looking at a, a little bit more of a nuance. And what I tried to do here, um, and I don't think I achieved as well in the first one, was to try to make this much more approachable. I mean, their in, initial reviews are coming in, and it's been, ama- I've been again, I've been a little overwhelmed. Don't you just go up to the mountaintop and speak to the Zen master yeah. and then uh, and meditate? Isn't that the way yeah. out? Yeah. Do you know what? Actually, that's, I, I, actually, that's one of those things I rail against in the book. Oh, okay. Is that, is that um, St. Augustine really wrote about three ways of life. I mean, an active way, a contemplative way, and what he characterized as that third way, an, an active contemplation. And I would say that we all want to have that latter. I mean, that very last one. We don't necessarily want to be completely active, completely extroverted, maybe to use today's uh, jargon. But see, I can't meditate because I can't do the lotus position. Oh, My knees don't fit that shot. way, and so you know, I don't. Yeah. I, 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 you, you can find meditation in, in in this in any space in your life. I mean, I was chat. I was at a Kentucky Derby party last night and talking to a few friends, and one of the topic the, the book came up because um, it's it's just kind of hitting me in my life right now. And we were talking about all these other places you can find peace. Um, and I would say that in, in this notion of c- contemplation, you have to embrace silence, stillness, and solitude. I mean, I, you, you just have to find places to carve that out. Um, I will tell you that one of the best places for me in my life is that 14-hour-plus um, trip in the car by myself down to Florida once or twice a year. 
Hmm. I mean, it's a completely yeah. disconnected. Turn the Only radio. Only if there's off. no traffic and and uh, uh, the the radio is is actually getting the right tunes uh, to. I, and and then when that happens to me, is I always get speeding tickets because I'm in that zone. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm contemplative, and I'm going 75 miles an hour. Um, and it, it depends on the on the on, <laughs> on, the on, 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 on the drive, and it depends a lot on where where you're um uh, what you're listening to. Um, I that's I, true. It, it is the music. If I listen to slow tunes, I'm I'm not going to go um, that fast. Well, slow tunes um in in a traffic jam may not actually be the best thing um yeah so. the suicidal tunes perhaps yeah. but, I, but i find up and everyone has their own yeah. thing i find personally that when i need to contemplate when i need some relaxation i tend to go to nature i, I go to the potomac river i go to the mountains mm -hmm. uh that nature somehow does it for me in a way that somehow sitting at home in front of my computer does not well i think you're absolutely correct i use the backdrop um the the, the narrative arc inside the book is a, a, a hike i took with a boy scout troop i was running um, a few decades ago in Taiwan, and it was a cross-island hike. They have Boy Scouts in Taiwan? They do, actually. They have American Boy Scouts in Taiwan. I did uh, not know that. Mm -hmm. See how much they, you learn here they, on they, React Radio? Uh, they, in fact, I think they still have three troops to the last time I checked. Um, three troops? Three three different troops. That's in different three parts boys. No, no, no. It's, it's, three it's, actually, a little, uh, it's a few more than that. I mean, all they're, right. all, they're all Americans. All right, um, so you're in Taiwan, um, and, and, and you're and in the forest of Taiwan? I, right. I, I don't know. We're where. right in the middle of the island, and so we were going through Aboriginal homeland. Okay. Um, so, in, in again, early '80s, um, these were pe these were people who, um, in many cases, Japanese was their first language because of the Jap Japanese occupation of Taiwan um, from the late 1890s uh, mm -hmm. until the end of World War II. Um, but it was just an amazing time to completely and totally disconnect and actually take the time to help these young men learn a little bit about themselves and about the world around them. Um, and I just use that as the framework because I think you're right, absolutely right, Mark. Um, moving yourself and re distancing yourself, active, doing this active distancing from all of this electronic, always-on world we're living in um, is absolutely essential. You, yeah, you, but Henry, you know, if I'm away from my phone or my computer for two hours, people keep trying to find me. Yeah. I hear beeps and buzzes and tweets, yeah. and I hear vi vibrations, and then the phone rings. Um, help! I, I, I can't escape them. Well, but you need to escape, because you need to escape to find yourself. Um, I, I mean, and at times, we all get addicted to it. We, I mean, it's, it, there's something, that, that adrenaline surge, that little bit of, that little shot of dopamine that happens as all of a sudden... Ding, the ding! Wait, hold on, I get my phone yeah, here. And, uh, I mean, a, a, the old AOL thing, you've got mail, just, uh, <laughs> could be one of the biggest charges in your life. I mean, unfortunately, now 60 That was pre-spam days. Yeah, and, and that mean, was when getting mail was exciting. Right, I mean, as opposed to the 60, 80 percent of the of the internet traffic being spammed today. Right, right, exactly. I mean, but I, I got Viagra, uh, you know, proposed uh, to me, and, um, and, and a Nigerian prince really wants to talk to well, me. Well, I, I think I could have made a lot of money over the years by all of these investments that have come my way. But I, <laughs> but the problem was that, um, that, I mean, they, like so many other things, were just false and, and misleading. So, so. this book, it, it, it's a fictional account uh, based on reality? Um, no, it's, it's actually a narrative. Um, so it, it really, it, it, it starts in three phases. It, it talks about the notion of entanglement. Um, and, and how we are sort of overwhelmed by all of this stuff. Um, uh, I mean, the career, the relationships, the physical, the spiritual things. And I, I, Okay, you've convinced me. Yeah. I think everyone's entangled. Yeah. What, what, so, so, um, that, so then move on. What, then, what do we then, do about then it? Then I pull, pull it back a little bit, and then I, I say, I mean, I talk about the concept. I mean, how do you embrace silence, solitude, and stillness? And then as, as some of the big pillars of, of untangling yourself in, through active contemplation. Um, and then putting it inside the framework of, the, of a conceptual, a continuous um, nature of, of going and looking at contemplation in your life. And then I end it. I mean, the last half, actually, of the book has a few concrete steps. And I don't say, here is your 12-step program to untangling. I, I can't do that. I mean, if, if you want me to do that... Um, wrong writer. Uh, no, no, but here's I, um, the thing. Look, I, I'm, I'm a talk radio host, mm -hmm. which means I'm a loud mouth. I talk a lot. Uh, in radio, silence is death. Yeah. It's yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. they, there's actually, uh, when people say radio silence, they mean ultimate death. The worst thing you can have on this, on this microphone yeah. is no sound. Yeah. So in this ADHD, attention <laughs> uh, deficit, high deficit, this, I don't even know what the thing means, Hi, hyper... Hyperactivity disorder. Yeah. Thank you very much. There, that was Jeffrey uh, helping helping out. Uh, in this, where we we, we yeah. need we need we need stimulation every single moment. We can't stop. We can't stop. Um, 
how could someone like me or someone like many of the people who are listening to us right now, I mean, you can't turn off your phone and your TV, can you? Well, yes, yes, you can. No, they don't have off switches. No. They, they do have off switches. And sometimes you actually need to take those off switches. Um, because, you know what? I mean, you, you have to make a choice. I mean, you can either be completely in, entangled like that, and then you get to end up being entertained by life. Or you can find that distance and end up being, uh, being able to give yourself that emotional cleansing, cleaning out that system to, to figure out how you actually engage in it. Do you ever watch The Office, the TV show? I do. Okay, one of my favorite episodes of The Office is they've got Ryan. I don't know if everyone who knows the characters of The Office, but Ryan's like the intern. He's, he's one of the younger people in The Office, and of course, he's into technology. And he's, he's bringing his, his iPhone, uh, as we would, as I would, to a bar. They're doing a trivia game. Uh, they're playing the trivia game, and the guy says to Ryan, sorry, you, you, know, you can't use your phone in the trivia game because you can look up the question in Google. Uh, please give me your phone. And Ryan is like reaching out like, no, no, don't take my phone. Anyway, they take his phone away and Ryan goes on about, oh, 20 more seconds in the trivia game. He's like, no, I can't do it. And he runs back, gets his phone and leaves the game. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, we are tethered to this world, this, this, this uh, cyber world. So what's the benefits of letting go? Well, th I think there are a lot of benefits, although I will say that I'm fortunate at times I live in a classified world as well. And so when we walk into some of these other facilities, we actually have to hand over all of our devices. Oh, wow. Um, so those devices don't get to come into us. So do you know what? Then we actually have to sit into a meeting and pay attention. Uh, what's uh, that? Um, yeah. Well, um, yeah, speaking of paying attention, I got a phone got a call phone right call. now. So let's see if, if someone actually wants to join in this conversation. Uh, you're on the air. Welcome to We Act Radio. Who's this? Hey, Mark. It's Michael S.W. from Bronx, New York City. Michael from the Bronx. Do you have a comment uh, to our guest, Henry, about the entanglement of uh, the Internet? Actually, I do. And as much as I um, find your guest, your guest to be quite informative, I'm in slight disagreement with him. Okay. And, and the reason being is that at this day and age, when you do a comparison of all the fact findings, especially when we're being briefed with news, um, you look at the television and you see stuff that's reported, but then when you're on the Internet, on Facebook, you see things that have not been reported. And I think that is how we are becoming more informed and more detailed. That, that's, a good, more that's a good point, yeah. Michael. Let me, let me raise it to Henry. So Henry, yeah. Michael yeah. makes a point. It's actually the point I made with the, actually the oh. Syrian guests. There's information you get from the Internet that's not being shown in your mainstream uh, news sources. Right. No, and I, I actually, for the guests, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I remember many years ago um, getting a, a magazine that did monthly press clippings of the world press. Um, just because I wanted to get a different perspective. Um, I was for, I've been fortunate. I've lived overseas a whole bunch of my life. And, I mean, it's always great to hear these other media sources. I used to curl up in college with the shortwave radio to just go and get other media so that you could get these other perspectives. So you're not saying no. turn off no. the Internet. You're just no, saying no. turn it off for a few hours a day. Right, or, or find a way so that you're not always just inside that digital envelope so that you're able to go there and be able to detox yourself. I mean, it's, it's very much like when you go, you go on a fast of some sort. Um, I mean, and not a purge, a fast, um, and or you've you've take you take caffeine out of your life. I mean, all of a sudden you get a different clarity and you get a different sense of direction. The question here is, how do you find a little bit of distance to be able to pull some of these other influences out of your life and then get to get to repack your bags? I mean, so, so, Michael, I think what he's saying he's not he's not saying turn it off entirely, no. unplug it, mm -hmm. throw away your computer. I mean, this is a technology guy after all. Yeah. He's, he's talking to Go us. On. He's just yeah. saying for what an hour a day, two hours a day, um, whatever you believe is necessary. Again, because at times you, you need to you need to clean out a little bit. Uh, a little bit more at the beginning, and then you just need to find a, those periods where you can go there and end up thinking for yourself. Because, if, uh, Michael, I mean, at times what ends up happening is that all, and Mark, this is not to be your, go I know, ahead. I know your job. Bring it on. Uh, I can take is it. Is that at times we, we listen to the radio, we listen to the TV, and but at times we need to be able to stop and think for ourselves. And I think that's actually what you challenge your listeners to do, is to stop and think for themselves. Absolutely. That's and I, I strongly way. agree that when you're not listening to my show, you should turn off the radio. So that's I'm fine with that. Go, go ahead, uh, Michael. Go, Michael. <laughs> that's, that's exactly where I was going with yeah. that, because the thing is that when we see um, stuff on Facebook and we're not seeing on the mainstream media, I for one feel that I'm not going to keep it to myself. I'm connected with so many friends. You want to spread the word and make sure everyone knows the truth for the sake of not just only yourself, but your fellow Americans. Yeah. And you don't want to get screwed 
by the people who's committing the injustice. Oh no, I, know, I would completely agree with power. that. Yeah, I mean, and, and sharing these and having and having the ability ability to have these friends that you can trust to share these questions and these comments and what you're thinking about. I think is as I drive go through the book. I mean, I talk a great deal about finding that distance, and I ended up I ended up with how do you allow yourself to awaken beauty in your life. I mean, it's that notion of, yeah. I mean, we, we get overwhelmed, and I mean, I, I, I go on and on about the difference between glamour and beauty, so that we, we, we don't have, the, like, these little cotton candy ideas. Um, right. We actually don't have some me meaningful wrong, ideas. Yeah, but don't get me wrong, though. I definitely understand what you're saying. In fact, there's a beautiful day outside here in New York City. I'm getting ready to go out and enjoy well, it. Well, go, go out and enjoy the day as soon as the show's over. Or you know what you can do? You can actually listen on your iPhone to my show as you're going out and enjoying the day. So, I'm sorry. I'm actually going totally against Henry's thesis here. But but thank you for your call, Michael. I always appreciate it when you call in. Always. Always. Good day, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Michael. Yeah, see, uh, so I, I just totally ruined your whole thesis because I said, no. listen to my show while, but you can. I mean, you can listen, go to marklevingtalk.com, you can listen on your iPhone, and you can, you can actually do two things at once. You can. You can, no, no, but, but no, that's okay. It's all right. You, I'm, I'm, I'm basically plugging my show, but what you're saying is that you should actually turn everything off at some point during the day just for your mental. Yeah, you, you, you actually, it's more than just turning things off because it's, it's, I mean, because that's the silence. I mean, there's also um, finding a place to quiet down, um, and that's that notion of stillness. So that wait, wait. Silence and stillness are different things. They are. They What's are, the difference between um, silence and stillness? And, well, and solitude. And um, solitude. And solitude. So that you. This are sounds actually, like confinement. I don't uh, know about it's this. It's not confinement. It's it, well, if 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 you find being with yourself and just by yourself confining, it is confinement. I guess. Right? So. Well, I guess it depends if you're in some small dark room with uh, the doors locked or not. Well, but, one, one would hope not. One is actually hoping that you're outside, enjoying the beautiful the, the be- nature, beautiful nature so around you. What is? I, I got what solitude is. That's okay. being alone. What's the difference between silence and stillness? Um, Silence is actually not having a lot of that audio m- bombardment around you so that you're able to m- remove yourself and all of those types of entanglements. And then stillness is actually sitting down and not fidgeting and not going there and just always being in motion. You can be quietly in motion, but you, at times you just need to stop. And if for those who are watching the webcast, I'm moving my hands back and forth in this whole notion of anti-stillness. Um, but I mean, uh, because each. But working right. out is good for me. I need the exercise. Right, and that that is part of it. But that's not necessary. I mean, but meditation is also good for you. Um, although at times I think I mean I also contend that I mean, contemplation is a little bit different than prayer or meditation. I mean, meditation at times is looking inward. Um, co- um, contemplation is looking around you, and then prayer is is this whole notion of looking to some other higher being. So I mean, I, I try to find again. Um, walking a very thin line from that St. Augustine laid out, I mean, uh, that that line. So, again, the name of your book is Untangled. Yep. I assume they can find it at Amazon. Um, and Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, any of the major online uh, outlets. You can buy it from the website, www.untangledthebook.com. Um, you can, it's available on Kindle. It's available on Nook. Um, first... And, so, yeah. and I'll, I'll put a link to it on my website yeah. uh, when we're done with this broadcast at marklivingtalk.com. Henry Senkowitz, thank you for coming oh. into the studio oh. and then sharing uh, your wisdom with us. Oh, great. Thanks for seeing you, Mark. I appreciate it so much. When we come back, I have some thoughts on Jason Collins. I want to talk about the first uh, male uh, pro basketball star, actually the first uh, of any of the major of any of the major sports to come out of the closet and I've got some thoughts on that if you want to call in it's 202-889-9797 we'll be right back with more of the Inside Scoop right after this Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine. So I've had three very different topics today. Uh, Everything from the situation in Syria to getting unentangled from the Internet to something that, um, well, I I think is is quite important. I'm talking about Jason Collins. 
and coming out as gay. He is, of course, the first male athlete in a major U.S. sport. And of course, major is all we can always argue about it. But the, most people talk about American sports. They talk about the big four, right? It's, it's basketball, baseball, football, of course, and uh, hockey. Some people even leave out hockey. But, uh, of course, uh, Jason Collins coming out was big news. Now, uh, it's amazing to me how many people have already been attacking this guy. Uh, they don't attack him so much for being gay. Uh, they attack him, I think, for trying to uh, get some kind of uh, publicity out of this as if there's something wrong with that. Um, I had on the air, on the Inside Scoop TV show, uh, a Republican strategist who was basically saying, you know, this guy is just trying to, to, to increase, to make his career go, and, uh, you know, he's, he's not the, 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 the best athlete in his, his uh, division, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, scoring and so forth and i i just thought that was kind of well kind of churlish to use an old-fashioned word kind of kind of mean kind of unfair uh i think it's you got to be pretty good to be in the nba to begin with thank you very much uh jason collins has been on six different teams he's largely a defensive player he's a big guy he's seven feet tall uh and he is known for being a, a heavy hard-hitting defensive player in fact i think that breaks a lot of the stereotypes of uh, a gay person uh, to be to be someone who's that that fighting and that defensive and that that strong physically as well as mentally. But I think that it's also unfair because he is the first, and I think more will come, and someone has to be the first. And frankly, I'm disappointed that we still need to have these kinds of firsts in America. And I look forward to the day when we'll have the last of the firsts, right? I mean, it just seems like for the last few decades, uh, ever since, I guess, Jackie Robinson integrated uh, in baseball, uh, you know, first black man, first woman on the Supreme Court, first black president, African-American president, uh, and now uh, the first uh, person to come out as gay on, uh, on, uh, on the sports team. But he won't be the last. There'll be the first football player. There will be the first hockey player. There will be the first baseball player. And then one day there will be no more firsts. One day every aspect of America will be open to everyone. Male, female, black, white, gay, straight, transgender, uh, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, atheist, poor, rich, every segment of society. And to me, that's what America is all about. To me, that's what makes America strong. It is our diversity. It is uh, the variance uh, the, amongst us that makes us such a strong nation. I mean, every other nation on earth has uh, one ethnicity, maybe two, maybe three. We are the country of everyone. And that means everyone, regardless of race, regardless of gender, and definitely regardless of sexual orientation. So for all those people like my Republican guest, who say, ah, it's no big deal what Jason Collins did. I say, if it's no big deal, how come no one did it before? If it's no big deal, why is the first male athlete to make this announcement in 2013? If it's no big deal, ask yourself this. All the gay athletes who've ever come out of the closet in baseball, football, basketball, and hockey, every one of them is at least seven feet tall. <laughs> and that'll tell you how rare it is and how brave it is for Jason Collins to come out. You know, he followed in a long footsteps uh, of people before. And yes, I, you know, you don't have to compare bravery, but certainly even more brave was someone like Martina Navratilova. That, that's bravery. Or Jackie Robinson, for that matter. That's bravery. I mean, there were Dodgers who said that they were not going to play on a team with a black man. And yet, uh, what he did has made a black person on a sports team to be not only un uninteresting and extremely common, it's, it's probably the majority. So how do we get there? Well, I think people like Martina Navratilova showed us the way. Think about what she did. This is back in the early 80s. I think the only person to come out of the closet in, that was an athlete before her was Billie Jean King, and she was outed. 
she was outed against her will in the early 70s. But Martina Navratilova was an immigrant from Czechoslovakia. She was a woman from then-communist Czechoslovakia, behind the Iron Curtain, looking to have freedom in America. And nine days before she's to become an American citizen, and in that day, being gay could very well affect your chances of becoming an American citizen. Nine days before her hearing, she was not outed. She was not forced out. She told the truth about herself at a time when the Women's Tennis Association was against her coming out, told her not to come out. And yet she did. She told simple truth that she's lesbian. And in doing so, she lost endorsements. She lost a lot of money. She lost millions and millions of dollars. But she told the truth. And then she went on to be the single winningest tennis champion in world history. I forget that she win 86 to 1 or 90 to 3, whatever it was. She won uh, well, well greater than 90%, probably closer to 98 or 99% of all her matches. She's a very good tennis player. But she also is someone with a lot of class. And when Jason Collins came out, she wrote a beautiful piece that didn't even mention the things that she had done. She played down her accomplishments. She said, well, I I was in an individual sport, which is true. She was an individual sport. I, you know, I'm a woman. It is easier, no doubt, for a woman to come out of the closet as an athlete than a man. You know, when women NBA players come out uh, as lesbian, people don't think much of it, I guess, because sports is seen as a masculine endeavor. And then comes Jason Collins. Uh, Jason Collins who secretly wore on his uniform the number 98 in honor of Matthew Shepard, the young gay man who was literally crucified on a rail fence in Wyoming and left to die in 1998. Now, 1998 was only 15 years ago. And I want to reflect on how far we've come since the days of Matthew Shepard. In 1998, it was not that hard for two young men to take a third young man and, uh, well, crucify him for being gay. But there's something really meaningful, I think, about a seven-foot-tall black basketball player wearing a jersey to remember a five-foot-two-inch young white guy in Wyoming who's crucified on a fence shows to me that being gay is in all cultures, in all peoples, doesn't matter whether you're tall or short or black or white or young or old, doesn't matter whether you're in Wyoming or in Washington, D.C. When you think about it culturally, Matthew Shepard and Jason Collins could not be more different from each other. And yet what, what a gesture for Jason Collins to remember Matthew Shepard in this way. In fact, uh, Matthew Shepard's parents were quite moved by, by Jason's gestures. And I'm sorry for all the people that say, well, you know what, he wasn't that good a player anyway. There's all kinds of players in the NBA. I have no doubt we're going to see some stars come out eventually. But the irony is that the stars are the ones that are getting the big endorsements. They're the ones that get all the advertising uh, contracts and uh, the millions of dollars. And frankly, it's a lot harder for them to come out. When you come out and you're a big star, you lose a lot of money. Martina Navratilova lost a lot of money, and yet she came out. And we're finding in the media, I've long known Anderson Cooper was gay, but he just came out. Good for him. And it was an amazing thing for me to watch and listen to Anderson Cooper talk with a number of people about Jason Collins coming out and mentioning, ever so matter-of-factly, his own journey, his own decision to come out publicly. I mean, most of these uh, people like Anderson Cooper had been out publicly to his friends and family for a long time, but he was afraid it would hurt his career. And of course, um, Anderson Cooper is very talented and has done quite well. I myself have been out of the closet since, well, since uh, long before I was in radio. I was out when I worked for Congressman Barney Frank as uh, his legislative counsel on the Hill. Of course, a gay guy working for a gay congressman, I guess, isn't that unusual. But you got to remember that when I moved here 
to Washington, D.C., and I lived, and I still live in Virginia, just across the river, it was illegal, illegal for gay people to have sex in Virginia. You could be arrested and put in prison to consenting adults for having sex. In fact, the law was so harsh in Virginia that married couples, male and female married couples, it was against the law to have oral sex. Now, that's not ancient history. That's less than 10 years ago. So we have come an amazingly long way. And I think it sometimes when you've come away in civil rights, and you look at the fact that Rhode Island becoming the 10th state to allow gay people to marry got almost no news at all. And Delaware's around the corner. And New Jersey's around the corner. This used to be big news. And now, nobody notices. And that's a good thing. You know, it's, it's still shocking to me that Don't Ask, Don't Tell ended just a year ago. For decades, we had people in the military not allowed to be honest. Not allowed to be honest. People who you would think are taught to be honest, right? Soldiers and airmen and, and, and uh, pe- uh, uh, people in the Navy, Marines. You would think integrity would be one of the things they teach in our military. And yet our military was requiring people to lie. Requiring our honorable armed forces who are risking their lives to help America, requiring them to lie. Saying that if you tell the truth, uh, First Amendment anybody? If you tell the truth, you will be fired. Only if you lie will you be allowed to succeed. And, you know, I can think of very few occupations where lying is a requirement. There, there are a few. I guess if you work as an undercover agent for the CIA, lying is a requirement. I guess if you're an actor, heck, if you're a poker player, then lying's part of the game. But if you are simply yourself, trying to be yourself, trying to be true to yourself, trying to tell the truth to the world, and you want to serve your country, until last year, that was illegal. So for all the people that are saying, ah, Jason Collins, I mean, it's not that interesting, so this guy happens to be gay, that's a good thing in a way, because it shows how far we've come. But let's look back just a little bit and recognize how far indeed we have come. The idea that it's uninteresting that a basketball player is gay in itself is an extremely far-reaching idea. Mahatma Gandhi once said, first they ignore us, then they ridicule us, then they fight us, then we win. I would add one more line to Mahatma Gandhi. I would add the last line, then they ignore us. You see, ignoring gay people or black people or women or the disabled or poor people or people of various religions, ignoring it first is a bad thing. It's a way of pretending they don't exist. What was Don't Ask, Don't Tell? It was pretending that gay people do not exist. Just recently, the uh, Iranian uh, dictator Ahmadinejad came to the United States and spoke at Colombia and was asked about gay people in Iran. He said, we have no gay people in Iran. Heck, I can remember back uh, when the Soviet Union was falling apart and the first joint interview between a Russian and American audience, I remember it was Donahue show and his Russian counterpart. And one of the Americans asked one of the Russians about uh, gay freedom in Russia. And they said, we don't, we don't have gay people in Russia. Ignoring gay people, just like, frankly, blacks were ignored. In the South, you can go back to 30s, 40s, 50s, heck, even the 60s. There'd be the, the domestic in the room, right? And that would be a, an African-American woman or man serving a rich white family. And they would talk about all kinds of things. And the person in the room was ignored. It was like they didn't exist. Ralph Allison talked about an invisible man, meaning the African-American in the room and not noticed. Almost like you would feel free to talk about anything in front of a dog. White people used to feel that way about black people. Men used to feel that way about women. 
women would be in the room, but they weren't seen as fully human or fully equal or whatever, then, and, 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 and they, would, they wouldn't be noticed. When Thomas Jefferson said, all men are created equal, oh, I don't think he was thinking about women. The men, uh, women, excuse me, women, African Americans, gay people, were ignored. First, they ignore us, says Gandhi. Next, they ridicule us. When African Americans wanted full and equal rights, when women wanted full and equal rights, when gay people want full and equal rights, they are ridiculed. Ridiculed. The idea that a black man could have the same rights as a white man, even Lincoln couldn't quite fathom that. That a woman could also vote and could make decisions as well as a man. That gay people could get married just like straight people. Ridicule. What a ridiculous idea. What a crazy notion. Equality under the law. First they ignore us. Then they ridicule us. Then Gandhi says they fight us. Right now it's no longer crazy that gay people can get married. That women can vote. That black people can be citizens and free independent human beings. Now that we've gotten past ignoring and ridicule comes the fight. But then, Gandhi says, then we win. First they ignore us, then they ridicule us, then they fight us, then we win. And we're seeing in gay civil rights a transition from the fight to the win, to where even many Republicans are given up, where Rob Portman, has, Senator Portman, a, a conservative Republican from Ohio, has a son who's gay, and suddenly he doesn't want to fight anymore. Dick Cheney, evil on any progressive scale. Horrible person and, and, and probably someone who has uh, committed a traitorous act in outing a CIA agent. I mean, I, no defense of Dick Cheney here, but his daughter's gay. So on that issue, he suddenly he's okay. The more people come out, the easier it is for the next generation to come out. Coming out is not an easy thing to do. I, I can say it so personally. But the more gay people, the more lesbian people, the more transgender people, the more people come out of the closet, bisexual as well, the more people realize this is just an ordinary difference of human existence. And it makes it easier for everybody else. I did a uh, YouTube interview on the Inside Scoop back in 2008. Seems like ages ago, five years ago. I did it as a joke, but a very meaningful joke. I did it as satire. I did a clip on why I thought, or I argued, we should ban left-handed marriage to keep left-handed people from marrying. Because I argued, what's left-handedness? It's a perversion. It's different. It's not normal. And it isn't. 90% of the world is right-handed. 90% of the world is straight. Left-handedness, while natural and genetic and something you're born with, is something that's different. It's abnormal. It's not usual. It's a perversion. And indeed, as I pointed out in the video, there was a time when left-handedness was considered sinister. In fact, the word sinister is from the Latin for left-handed. In fact, if you look at the French, maladroit, you know that word that means clumsy? What does it literally mean? It means not to the right. Listening, people who know French out there, maladroit, not to the right, maladroit. You're left-handed, you're clumsy, you're sinister. My own grandfather, by the way, growing up in New Orleans uh, in the 1920s, my own grandfather was left-handed and yet was required by his elementary school teacher back um, 80, 90 years ago, uh, required to use his right hand to write because the left hand was wrong and right was right. And to the day he died, my grandfather did everything with his left hand. He ate with his left hand. He fished with his left hand. But he continued to write with his right hand. He was forced against his nature to write with his right hand for no reason whatsoever. And that's what people have been trying to do to gay people for years and years and years. Force gay people to act against their nature in ways that made straight people feel better. So I did this video, which you can still find. Go to YouTube.com sometime and type in ban left. And you will see my impassioned argument for why we shouldn't let left-handed people marry. And what's funny about the video, funnier than the video, is the comments. 
because two thirds, three quarters of the people realize it's satire, realizing I'm making a point about gay rights at the time I'm talking about left handed people. And then maybe a quarter of the people don't get it at all and think I'm attacking left handed people because uh, I don't break a smile. I try very hard not to. I'm doing my full Colbert like function. And they can understand why I'm so uh, nasty against left handed people. The best part of the video is the caller, young man by the name of Jose. He was not. Uh, a plant, I assure you. He was a young man who called into my show who could not understand why I wanted to stop left-handed people from marrying, but at the same time, he wanted to stop gay people from marrying, and he couldn't tell the difference. The point is this. Coming out of the closet, whether it's gay, today left-handed means nothing. Today, uh, you know, uh, the difference between men and women wanting men's jobs, still there's a little bit of that, but much less. First they ignore us, then they ridicule us, then they fight us, then we win. And then, I'm going to add to Mahatma Gandhi, they can ignore us again. Because the issue is not whether you're gay or straight. The issue is not, oh my God, Jason Collins hogging the microphone, saying he's gay. What a, what a prima donna. When enough athletes come out as gay, it will again be a non-issue the way it should be. The way it shouldn't matter whether a player is black or white. For Jackie Robinson, it was a big deal. Today, it's not a big deal. And I look forward to the day when it will never again be a big deal. And that will be when America has truly grown up. If you want to call in, it's 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. You can follow me on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk. Or go to my website, marklevingtalk.com, and uh, type whatever you wish. We'll be right back with more right after this. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine uh, talking about Jason Collins coming out of the closet and why it is a big deal still. It's interesting because, of course, women have been athletes, have been coming out of the closet for decades now. I brought up that uh, uh, Martina Navratilova came out in the 80s voluntarily. Uh, Billie Jean King came out involuntarily in the 1970s, and it, it really harmed her endorsements and so forth. And that's uh, one of the reasons why it's still brave to come out. But it is easier for a guy, excuse me, it's easier for a woman than, than for a man. In fact, uh, just a few days before Jason Collins come out, came out, uh, a, a WNBA star, Brittany Griner, came out, and virtually no one noticed. Yeah, another uh, female athlete coming out. No big deal. And I'm glad it's no big deal for women. Frankly, that, that's that last stage, right? That's that last part of Mahatma Gandhi's quote. First they ignore us, then they ridicule us, then they fight us, then we win. Then, this is the Mark Levine edition, then they ignore us again. So I don't really mind, uh, it's, you could say it's sexist, but I don't really mind the fact that people are mostly ignoring Brittany Griner because she's not the first or the second or the fifth or the tenth woman to come out of the closet. But it is fascinating when you think about it, how much easier it is for any woman to come out as lesbian than it is for a guy to come out as gay. And I think that has to do with the misogyny in our culture. You see, it's okay for a woman to act like a man. It's not okay for a man to act like a woman. I want you to think about this. If a woman wants to wear pants, who complains? Maybe 50 years ago, someone might complain, you're not wearing a skirt or a dress, but a woman wearing pants... It's a pretty natural thing. Heck, even if a woman wants to wear a tie, the Annie Hall look in the 70s, nobody really will say anything. No one seems to mind a, a woman wearing man's clothes or taking a man's job. And in fact, it's offensive to even suggest there is such a thing as a man's job. And I agree. But if a man wants to do a woman's job, if a man wants to be a nurse, and there are male nurses out there, if a man wants to be a flight attendant... Of course, there are male flight attendants out there. We used to call them stewardesses. If a man wants to wear a skirt and he's not Scottish and it's not a kilt and he wants to wear a dress, who the heck cares? 
Why does it matter? Why does a woman who wants to wear a man's clothes be, in, is it, she's entirely normal and natural, and a man who wants to wear a woman's clothes, he needs psychiatric help. Have you ever thought about why that is? Now, I want to be clear here. I've never put, I have no desire to put on women's clothes. That's not something I'm into. <laughs> this isn't about me. And, but who am I to tell anyone to wear anything? When will we get rid of these notions? I think this idea, and I think the reason why it's easier for a lesbian to come out of the closet than a gay man is precisely because people understand why women want to be men, why men, women want to be equal, or why women want to have uh, men's clothes, or, or to have, frankly, men are privileged in our society, way privileged. So when women want those strong privileges, who can blame them? Few do. Maybe there are a few anti-feminists left in this world, and... They're awful people. But most of us seem to understand that women deserve equal pay for equal work, equal rights to jobs. I believe women should be in combat. I've been very clear about that. Uh, any woman who can do the job of a man should be able to do the same job, period. Whether that job is combat, whether that job is president of the United States, it doesn't matter what the job is. And that's something that most people understand today. But if a man wants to do a job that is largely thought of as a woman's job, if a man wants to dance, right, in ballet, or be a nurse, or be a flight attendant. What's interesting is that most of the men who've taken these jobs, these, quote, womanly jobs, unquote, many of them are gay. And that's the stereotype, right? A male nurse has to be gay. A, what about a man who cuts your hair? What about a male florist? Flight attendant? Dancer? Well, they have to be gay. And to be fair, a lot of gay men have taken on these jobs because they want them and because they're not bothered by the stereotype that says you have to be macho, you have to be masculine, and you can't be a masculine florist or flight attendant or nurse. But why the heck not? You know, a male nurse might have the strength to lift uh, a, a, a fat person from a bedpan. Of course, a woman might have that strength too. You know, a male nurse might, you might need a good male nurse strong to lift a patient. That's very important. It's this idea of, of sort of, well, the subsidiary role, that's, that's for women, that's for gay men. What, what I think Jason Collins shows us is that, that we still live under these stereotypes. Those of you who think, well, it's no big deal, soon there will be a lot of gay athletes that will come out, and that's true. Recognize that we still have a ways to go. Until every man who wants to be a nurse can be a nurse, or a flight attendant, or a florist, or a gymnast, without being thought of as gay, we, we haven't crossed the line yet. Right? Every woman should be able to do any man's job. Every man should be able to do woman, every woman's job. We should not distinguish in occupation whether someone is male or female, gay or straight. So Jason Collins, thank you for helping us move one step further in that regard. And don't ever think coming out is easy. In the African-American community, I would venture it's harder than in the white community. And I'm, you know, it's, it's, he's, it's good that he's defied all stereotypes. I remember when Rock Hudson came out course he was forced out because he had aids but rock hudson was this strapping male actor who was praised for his masculinity well jason collins <laughs> he's seven feet tall he's an active bruising player and i think he stunned and helped people understand that yes there's gay people of all shapes and sizes but let me give a notion out to some other people in power who have more power than Jason Collins, who are still in the closet. Yes, I'm talking to you, Senator... I'm not going to say the name. I'm not going to say the name because even though I think this particular senator from a very democratic state should come out of the closet because I think when this senator comes out, it will surprise some, not to those of us in Washington. I, I happen to know of at least three senators who are gay in Congress that have not come out. 
one from a very liberal democratic state, one from a very conservative Republican state, and one from, uh, I guess, a, a more moderate state in the middle. But they haven't come out yet. They're not as brave as Tammy Baldwin, the first openly gay senator from Wisconsin. But they need to be. Because the more people come out, the more people realize it's no big deal. The more people understand that that's just part of the nature of humanity. And the easier it is for that kid in school to live his or her life and not be taunted and not be mistreated. To this day, a third of the teenagers that kill themselves are gay. And we know a third of teens aren't gay. But they're highly represented in the suicide population. Once people understand that, yes, people of all stripes are gay or bisexual or lesbian, then it's a lot easier for that next generation. Martina Navratilova made it easier for Jason Collins. Jason Collins will make it easier for the football player, the hockey player, the baseball player to come out. And they will. We already have ex-football, ex-NFL players, ex-NBA players, ex-baseball players who've come out of the closet. But Jason Collins was the first male athlete to come out who was still actively playing. And I hope it helps his career. No doubt it hurt Martina Navratilova's career. But I hope we have reached the stage where it's a plus for Jason Collins, who is 34 years old and is not, you know, he's not the top rung of players. But he's steady. He's been on six different teams. I hope it helps him. I hope teams work hard to get a gay player. I got to tell you, it's partly, I think, because the teams have shown that they can support gay people, that it's been easier for people like Jason Collins to come out. The NHL made it very clear, the National Hockey League, that they supported gay players coming out. You had some terrific straight football allies write very strong words to make clear that they would support their colleagues coming out that, again, made it easier for Jason Collins to come out. And Jason, to his credit, mentioned in the Sports Illustrated article that all of you should read, mentioned and praised all the people that came before him. And the other thing that he said that I think is really important is that he wanted to come out on his own terms. There's a huge difference between the National Enquirer outing you and following you and watching your every move and then disclosing in some sordid way that you happen to be gay or lesbian and you coming out on your own terms, bravely saying, yeah, I'm gay, what of it? There's a huge difference. And Jason now no longer has to live in fear. See, what I think straight people don't understand is that gay people, are before they come out, constantly live in fear. Who knows? Who's going to out me? Who's going to um, keep me from achieving what I want in my career or my life? Who's going to tell my family? It's like you've committed a crime, only you've done nothing wrong. But once you come out, all those fears go away. I mean, look at someone like Anderson Cooper, right? People whispered all the time. And now he's out, and it's no big deal. And there's a certain self-satisfaction, there's a certain self-worth in being able to honestly say who you are. And that's what Jason Collins did. And I think that we can, while we still have a ways to go as a nation, and we still have a ways to go where a male, a man can be a nurse or a flight attendant or a florist without being thought of as gay, where women can fight in combat and women can play basketball without being thought of as gay. So we, we actually have some straight stereotypes we have, to, we have to stop. We have to allow straight people to do these things. Just as we have gay male basketball players, we need to have straight female basketball players and, and, and not be worried about that. We need to have gay, uh, straight male ball, uh, ballet dancers, just as we know we have some very brave gay men and women fighting in combat and serving their country in the military. So we still have a ways to go. But if you 
ever want to look back and see how far we've come, well, just look at Jason Collins. In any civil rights movement, any civil rights movement, You can always look back and forward. You should always look back and forward. You should always recognize how far we've come. You should always recognize how far we have yet to go. And yet with Jason Collins, I think it would be unheard of just five years ago for a male athlete to decide to come out on his own without being outed by some sordid tabloid newspaper. And it's because... Barack Obama now supports marriage equality. It's because the majority of American people now support marriage equality. It's because figures like Anderson Cooper have come out. It's because of will and grace. It's because our culture has changed. I got a call on the line. Let's get to that real quick before I sum up. Who is on the line here? Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Hello, this is We Act Radio. Mark Levine, you're on the air. Is this, uh, I don't know if this call is, is meant for the air. I don't hear anyone. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Ah, turn off the mute button. There we go. Who is this? This is uh, Yusuf Muhammad from Las Vegas, Nevada. Hello, welcome to the show. Do you have a comment on what I'm saying about Jason Collins coming out? Uh, I was just trying to call because I, I was watching the Rock Newman show, and uh, I wanted to find out about uh, him and Rock, Rock scheduling uh, a showdown for the minister in Las Vegas. Uh, okay, you're, you're calling into a radio show at We Act Radio in Washington, D.C., Mark Levine's Inside Scoop. Are you calling in the right number? <laughs> uh, I was calling on the number that he, uh, Rock gave uh, le- uh, week before last. Okay, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure you're calling the right place right now, but uh, okay. l- let me get you off the air and you can, you can call again. Thanks. Sorry about that. I, I sometimes I, I don't have a producer in the studio, and I take my own calls, and uh, I'm not sure what that was about. But let me let me just close up by saying this: If you ever want a milepost for how far we've come, just look at the response to Jason Collins coming out versus well, just the actively anti-gay rhetoric that we heard five years ago. I mean, it was five years ago that we heard comments by various uh, sports people that they, they didn't like gay people, uh, or they wouldn't work with gay people. And what happened? Well, this, now, unlike the Women's Tennis Association didn't want, didn't want Martina Navratilova to come out, now you're fined by the uh, NFL or the NHL if you make anti-gay comments. And... What it shows is that when people at the top make very clear that homophobia won't be punished, it makes it a lot easier for people to come out. Harry Truman made it very clear in 1948 to all the racists in the military who didn't want the military to be segregated that he would not tolerate people, uh, whites who refused to serve with blacks in the military. And there were whites who did refuse to serve with blacks in 1948, and they were drummed out lickety-split. So the same is true with sports today. If you make homophobic comments, you are fined. You are punished. So it's striking to me that the only negative comment that I've read about Jason Collins coming out was uh, a a sports guy named uh, uh, Mike Wallace. And Mike Wallace gave was really a fairly limited response. It wasn't near as homophobic as some of the really nasty stuff that we saw as recently as 2007 or 2011. He said, all these beautiful women in the world and guys want to mess with other guys. Shake my head, SMH. As anti-gay comments go, that's relatively tame. That's something that some of my friends might say to me as a joke. And yet... Almost within minutes, actually within minutes, four minutes later, he had deleted that tweet and followed it up with, I'm not bashing anybody, don't have anything against anyone, I just don't understand it. I'm laughing because, well, it shows how far we've come. It shows how far we've come that even a relatively harmless tweet was immediately deleted. Because we live in a different world from just five years ago. A world where prejudice is at least not publicly tolerated. And that is a big step forward. 
Obviously, we still have racism. Obviously, we still have sexism. But the fact that racism and sexism are much less publicly tolerated is a big step forward. And the same is true with homophobia. And sports was honestly, now that the military is, uh, has equality and marriage is coming up with equality, sports for men, that was kind of was the last readout. The last place where homophobia could continue to exist was the locker room. And Jason Collins... You've taken a big step forward in ending that prejudice. So we still have a few more firsts to go. We're going to wait for the first football player and, of course, the first hockey player and uh, the first baseball player to come out. And it's going to be tough. And then they're going to say, wait for the first uh, really good player to come out. Right? They're going to wait for the first Martina Navratilova of baseball, uh, the one that hits most of the home runs to come out. And then he'll come out too. And then, and then, and then there'll be no more firsts. And then there will come a day when, to quote Martin Luther King, when people aren't judged by the color of their skin, when all humanity can come together. On the day when there are no more firsts, on the day when it really is not news, whether someone is gay or straight, whether a black or a white person is playing on a team, whether your doctor is male or female, whether your senator is a man or a woman, or gay or straight. So come out, come out wherever you are. I'm out. And I encourage everyone to come out too. When you come out, you're not just helping yourself and you are helping yourself. It's a lot easier to live the truth than a lie. It's very, very hard to keep up with that lie. But you're helping generations to follow. Jason Collins is one of the last of the firsts. And he can only do what he did because of all the firsts that came before him. So if you're listening, three senators in Washington who are still not out of the closet, two of you I know could come out right now and have no political harm to you whatsoever. You live in states that are solid blue states, solid progressive states, states that would welcome your coming out. And frankly, you have no excuse not to do so. And uh, to you, Senator, that's from a solid red Republican state, I understand why you're in the closet. But I look forward to the day when even you can come out. That day, eventually, still not too far away, when all men and women are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jason Collins, you've taken us one step forward to fulfilling Thomas Jefferson's words, Declaration of Independence, and I personally want to thank you for it. And I hope you're listening, like all the Washington Wizards, to We Act Radio, AM 1480. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want more information on me, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk, M-A-R-K-L-E-V-I-N-E-T-A-L-K. You can go to my website, MarkLevineTalk.com. Follow me on Facebook. Friend me. I'll friend you back, I promise. Go to the Mark Levine fan page, and I'll be back, of course, next week right here at We Act Radio for the Raucous Caucus at noon and the Inside Scoop at 1. Until then... This is Mark Levine signing off. Next up is Maya Rockymore, and you're going to hear from her just two minutes from now.